Good morning and welcome to our service from St Nicholas Great Bookham. I'm Alan Jenkins and I'll be leading us through the service and I'll be joined this morning by Celeste Rios and Bill Whitman who will be bringing our Bible readings and Peter Lutton who will be leading us in our intercessions. That is our prayers. Now, you don't need me to remind you that today is Valentine's Day, or perhaps you do. Either way, happy Valentine's Day to you. And so at the beginning of this service, we're focused on the theme of love, although not so much romantic love as God's love for us, our love for him and our love for others because of his love for us. As ever, there will be words for you to join in, and so I now invite you to join in the response to these opening words of praise. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made perfect in us. Amen. And then as we continue in prayer, I'll lead us with these words. Father in heaven, our loving Father, you invite us to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our one and only Saviour. We cannot see you, but we feel your presence. We know how near you are because your love is in our hearts and our minds are lifted up above the mundane and the material, to know things heavenly and eternal. We cry out for love and affection. Help us to look to you to satisfy our deepest needs. We are perplexed. Enable us to unravel in your presence some of the mysteries of life. Whatever the magnitude of our need, help us to believe that you are greater, that your love is so strong, it is able to hold us secure, even when we feel most vulnerable. Make us sensitive to your call and open to your word, that we may know and feel your grace, sustaining and strengthening us. We ask this in the name of our risen Lord Jesus. Amen. And remaining in prayer, we come to God in a prayer of confession. Today we are reminded that it is God's love for us that enables him to forgive us. And that confessing where we have fallen short is a fantastic way of expressing our love for God. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. A moment of silence. Come, let us return to the Lord and say, Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds and revive us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to the first of our Bible readings. Thank you, Celeste, which will then be followed by the wonderful hymn, Be Thou My Vision. The first reading is taken from... 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 to 6. 
present weakness and resurrection life. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displaced in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel is taken from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St Mark, beginning to read at the second verse. The Transfiguration After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them, and there appeared before them 
Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. I want you, if you will, to recall an experience so good that you wished it could go on for much longer than it did. Maybe you wished it would go on forever. Maybe even you wished you could bottle it up and keep it. For those who have known the blessing of a good marriage, maybe you think of your wedding day. Or what about that holiday that seems so idyllic you just wished it would never end? Or what about when you heard the news you had passed your driving test, having failed it six times before? That wasn't my experience, by the way. Well, if you have had such an experience, you're somewhere close to Peter's experience in the event that we know of as the Transfiguration. So let us look again for a few minutes at that Gospel reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Here again is verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. Up a high mountain. At the risk of stating the obvious, a lot of biblical action, especially significant biblical action, happens up mountains. Well, as one who has enjoyed skiing in the mountains, all I can say is, great choice. It was here that Jesus was transfigured before them. The first thing to happen was that his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. I confess it does sound a bit like an advert for Daz. Or was it personal? Either way, even if it does, let me just remind you that the Transfiguration happened at least 1900 years before Daz and personal ads even began to appear. And then verse 4, there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now why Elijah and Moses? Well there have been a number of suggestions but one credible one is that Elijah appears because he was expected to come back and usher in the day of the Lord. And Moses appears because he left a promise that God would send to his people a prophet like him. In other words, the reappearance of these two great worthies from the past underlines the fact that the time of fulfilment for God's promises had arrived in the person of Jesus. Well, whatever the precise reason for their appearance, it's at this point that Peter decides that the right thing to do would be to put up three shelters, one for Moses, one for Elijah and one for Jesus. This brings us back to what I was saying just now 
about wanting to bottle an experience. This, perhaps, is Peter trying to bottle this experience. It's his equivalent of trying to pin, pin things down, not wanting them to change, to make it last. Even if Mark in his Gospel goes on to say that Peter did not know what to say because they were so frightened. This, though, was not the end of it. There was more to come. Verse 7. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Does that ring any bells with you? Perhaps. For isn't this somewhat reminiscent of an earlier encounter, namely the moment of Jesus' baptism, when we're told that as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. In both encounters, God draws near, very near. And in both encounters, a voice, God's voice, is heard. However, if those are the similarities, one obvious difference is that at his baptism, God addresses his son. Here, however, it is not his son, Jesus, whom God addresses, but those looking on. Listen to him is God's clear instruction. In passing, we might note that this command, listen to him, is not irrelevant in our own day. For our task too, as Christian believers, is to listen to him, to listen to what Jesus is saying to us as a church, to listen to what Jesus is saying to us as individuals, to listen to what Jesus is saying to us as a society and the direction in which we are heading. Listen to him. Well, no sooner had God spoken than the whole event was over. Verse 8. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. I'm thinking if I had been one of the disciples, I would be wondering whether what I had just witnessed had really happened, whether I had been dreaming, whether I had really seen and heard what I was thinking. I had seen and heard. Jesus, though, was in no doubt that the experience had been real. Verse 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man, that's Jesus, of course, had risen from the dead. There's an interesting point of detail here. If you're familiar with Mark's Gospel, you'll know that on occasions when Jesus had done something, he commanded those who had seen it not to tell anyone else, to tell, not to tell people what they had seen. This, though, is different. Not simply are they told not to tell anyone, but not to tell anyone until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The need to keep this confidential in other words, was not open-ended, but time-limited. Why? Well, presumably, because once Jesus had risen from the dead, people would start to understand, would start to piece things together, would start to realise that everything in his ministry must be understood through the lens of his death and resurrection. But until that time, there would be great capacity to misunderstand. Now, as I conclude, let's step back and just ask ourselves what the Lord may be wanting to say to us through this mountaintop experience. Ten years ago, I went to the tiny island of Iona, off the west coast of Scotland. It was while I was there 
that I heard that Iona is often described as a thin place. A place where the veil between heaven and earth often feels so thin that one encounters God in a powerful way. Since then I have heard that description used quite a few times to describe those places and occasions when the distance between heaven and earth seems so small it feels as if they have touched. God in his mercy sometimes gives us those mountaintop experiences, those thin place times. They are wonderful when they happen, but they are not to be bottled any more than the disciples could bottle that transfiguration experience. Rather, they are given to us so that they can be enjoyed, appreciated, celebrated in the moment. But they are given too, I suggest, so that when we are in the valley, in the difficult times, in the hard times, they can be recalled, treasured, drawn strength from. So let me ask you, what is your experience of mountaintop times? When have those thin place experiences been true for you? Those times when God has seemed especially near. I'm so grateful to Ali Sanguine for being willing to share with us a couple of her mountaintop thin place experiences. What Ali's testimony reminds us of is that actually we don't have to go up a mountain to have a mountaintop experience. But rather often God meets us and draws particularly near in the everyday events. During my Christian journey I've been very lucky and I have quite often felt close to God and felt that he's been walking alongside me and guiding me. But there have been two particular occasions where something quite extraordinary has happened. The first occasion was March the 15th, 1994, and it was when I broke my leg. So I was 34 years old and I'd got two little children and I was out in the garden and I slipped and I made a really good job of smashing up my leg and my ankle. And I was on my own and it was March, so it was showery and horrible. And I was really frightened. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get help and I was stuck and you the no mobile phone in your pocket in 1994. So... I was frightened and I was finding it hard to catch my breath and I was in a lot of pain and all of a sudden as I was lying there and I was rocking back and forth I felt that I was being hugged and I could feel that I was being held tight and rocked with and I could feel that I was being rocked and I could hear a voice in my ear saying Oh, you poor, poor thing. Oh, I'm so sorry. And don't worry, it's all going to be fine. And the rocking continued until I was calm. And I got help and all was fine. And I was, wasn't positive that it was definitely God that was holding me until I reflected on the massive effect it had had on me. It wasn't the sort of effect that you would get from something that was in your imagination. Despite quite a long, hard journey to recovery, my family and I had really quite a special time during that time. We were all very calm, very relaxed about everything and very contented. And I just felt so privileged to have actually being comforted in that way by our father. And then the other occasion was much more recently, it was just before Christmas. I'm sure we've been in exactly the same position uh, where we've been concerned about our friends 
and normally we would have got in the car and gone to see them and we would have taken a casserole and given them a hug because they're having a hard time. Well, my friend's having a really hard time at the moment and so I thought, well, I know what I can do. I can pray for her. And to be honest, I had got rather zealous with the praying and I would got quite anxious and worried and in a stew. And I was praying for her really frequently and passionately and feeling over anxious. And then all of a sudden a voice came in my head that said, don't worry, Ali, they're all going to be fine. And I thought, OK. And then it happened again and again, which is a bit like the story of Samuel, isn't it, where God keeps on giving the same message. And it was always the same words. Don't worry, Ali, they're all going to be fine. And again, the effect on me of hearing that message has been hugely calming. It's made me relax far more. And also, it has proved to be the case. They are all fine. Uh, there isn't anything to worry about. It is all fine. And I've also been able to relay the message that I had in my ear frequently that things are going to be fine to my friend who's a Christian. And that has also been a source of great comfort to her and her family. So it is, again, a double blessing. I know that I'm really, really privileged to have these experiences and I'm really glad to share them with you because I hope they'll be a blessing to you as well to just know that we can experience that real closeness. We can hear God and feel him as well as knowing by faith that he is alongside us. Ali, thank you so much for being willing to share your experience with us. And as Ali said in that uh, short film, uh, she hopes that in sharing her experiences, that will be a blessing to you. In a moment, we're going to come to our intercessions, but as we will be praying for the work of the Bible Society, let's enjoy a very short film from the Bible Society first. 2020 was a year like no other. But even in the darkest moments, you went on helping us with your generous donations. And so we saw still more lives change for good by the Bible. Covid outbreaks had left 88 Bible societies at risk of imminent closures. But supporters like you stepped in. You gave a million pounds to a solidarity fund to help those in most difficulty. You gave record amounts to our 2020 China appeal to support Chinese Christians with God's word. And we celebrated the moment the 200 millionth Bible rolled off the production line at Amity Printing Press in Nanjing. In Africa, you supported 16 Bible translation projects, distributed two and a half thousand children's Bibles in churches across Malawi, and provided help for around 700 families caught in devastating floods in Niger. 2020 saw the biggest Bible distribution in Syria ever, with 28,000 children getting a copy of Scripture. And we have continued to provide trauma healing to refugees and victims of war in the Middle East. Your gifts have enabled mission in England and Wales too. More than 4,000 prisoners, some facing isolation for hours at a time from lockdown restrictions, received a Bible or Gospel booklet thanks to you and our Psalm 23 garden to be featured at the Chelsea Flower Show has become more relevant than we ever imagined in these troubled times. All this and much more has been made possible because of you and your donations. You've changed so many lives for good. Thank you so much for your support. Covid may still dominate the lives of so many, but we are determined to keep on serving, bringing light and hope in 2021. The response to the invitation, Lord, challenge us, is, and help us to bring about your kingdom. Lord, challenge us, and help us to bring about your kingdom. 
Dear Lord, we bring to you in prayer the many worries and concerns that most of us share in these continuing times of individual difficulty and communal turmoil. We know that you said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. We thank you for helping us to get through this far, and we pray for your strength to carry on whenever we doubt both ourselves and others. Help us to continue to put our trust in you and in your eternal promises. Lord, challenge us and help us to bring about your kingdom. We regularly support as a parish the Bible Society, whose work we have just heard more about. Do not let us take access to your word for granted. We remember that there are people in more than a few countries who are forbidden it, particularly by governments who fear any power that they do not understand and that they cannot control. Help us to contribute to the work of the Bible Society in any way we can, as the Society works hard to bring the Bible to those who are desperate for the good news. We ask for your help particularly in regular prayer and in giving what we can to help, since they are under very great financial pressure. Lord, challenge us and help us to bring about your kingdom. On a day when love, the emotion we all hope to experience and to share, is celebrated, Help us to see that it is not just the love of one person for another, nor is it something that can be shown on a balance sheet. We give thanks for sacrificial love, family love, love for creation with all the living beings in it, but most of all for the love you generously keep on giving to us, even when we do not deserve it. Guide us in our understanding of what love really means and help us to give it as much as to seek it. As an old song goes, love is nothing until you give it away. Lord, challenge us and help us to bring about your kingdom. We pray once more for those who are ill whether with long-standing conditions or because of the ongoing pandemic. Again, we ask for the strength you promise, both to keep going and to help others in our community to do the same. Guide us to support those who feel alone and helpless and to comfort all those who have lost family and friends recently, for whatever reason. Particularly, we pray for all who are cut off from those they love by the need to keep safe. Above all, give us the patience to persevere and not to lose heart. Lord, challenge us and help us to bring about your kingdom. Lord, you have given us so much, even now. Give us one thing more. A thankful heart. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Peter, so much for leading us in our intercessions. Well, our service is nearly at an end. May I remind you that if you would like to join with us for coffee, 
or at least for discussion while you drink your own coffee after this service. We're meeting over Zoom at 11.15 today for half an hour and the link for that is in my weekly email. If you would like prayer for any matter, please do drop us a line either using the email link at the end of this service or using the dedicated page on our website. If you would like to give to the work of the church financially, then please do make use of the appropriate page on our website. And if you're somebody who is not yet a member of St Nicholas and you've been just joining us uh, for a while and thinking maybe it's time I just kind of stuck my head above the parapet a bit more and let people know who I am, then drop me a line via our parish office. I would love to talk with you. And so to our second and our final hymn, there is a higher throne. Talking of thin places, there will come a day when faithful ones from every tongue will one day stand fully in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ. And you can't get much thinner than that. final prayer together. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.